Our speaker this evening, Dr. Roger Lear, is a podiatric surgeon from Thousand Oaks, California. A podiatric surgeon, in plain English, is a foot doctor. He earned his medical degree, medical degree from the California College of Podiatric Medicine in San Francisco in 1964. Dr. Lear went on to become the chief of the diabetic foot clinic at Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, which is now renamed Cedars Sinai, Hollywood, California, and then went into private practice. Dr. Lear has also worked in several research projects. He's getting international attention, however, as an author and researcher in another field, the field of pathology, because he is the first person to successfully employ medical and surgical procedures in the study of the alien abduction phenomenon. Dr. Lear is a medical consultant for MUFON International. Additionally, he's an officer of the MUFON chapter where he lives, Thousand Oaks, California. And he's a field investigator for both the local and international MUFON groups. He also functions as a consultant for various abductee support groups. Dr. Lear is the author of numerous magazines and newspaper articles, and a forthcoming book whose title is the same as his talk tonight, The Aliens and the Scalpel. Because of the worldwide interest in his work, Dr. Lear has appeared on dozens of radio programs across the nation and in other countries, including Canada, England, and South Africa. He has also appeared on the television program Paranormal Borderline and Strange Universe. Tonight he will tell and show the results of his pioneering research into alleged alien implants. His work is absolutely leading edge and provides, if the final results that he has to tell you about tonight bear out where the evidence points, this could provide the so-called smoking gun of ufology, which proves with indisputable evidence that there is an alien presence on our planet and is engaged in abducting, in abducting people. Now, when he has finished his presentation, he's going to be joined on the platform by Paul Davids, executive producer of the movie Roswell, which was shown so successfully on Egypt. On Showtime, on Showtime, who, will, who has been working with Roger Lear uh, in the analysis of a, a piece of debris which <coughs> appears to have come from the Roswell crash in 1947. The analysis of that debris and of the alleged alien implants uh, involves many similar processes and laboratories looking at both of those things. So I'm very pleased to bring to the podium Dr. Roger Lear. Thank you, John. That was the most uh, wonderful introduction that I think I've ever had. I barely recognize that as an introduction to me. <laughs> Does this work? <laughs> How's that? I, I don't like to, to hide in front of one of these things because, you know, <laughs> it's a free country and if there's something that I say that you don't like and you want to heave the tomato or the egg, you see, yeah. you'll never hit me. You got a fast on. Yeah. Boy, uh, this is just an absolute wonderful treat for me. Um, you know, I, I have to ask you, uh, I know John asked you originally, but uh, could I see a show of hands of uh, those that uh, have seen a UFO? Wow, that's, that's just as impressive uh, from seeing it up here as when I was sitting in the audience. How many of you folks uh, think that you might be intimately involved with the alien abduction phenomenon? That's, that's quite a large number. And of course we know that the numbers are probably a lot larger than what you see as uh, an orchestrated ratio in this room. You know, I, I've done a lot of presentations uh, through the years on medical subjects. 
which are usually dry and the audiences are trying desperately to stay awake and it's a lot of numbers and routine stuff. So I find that doing uh, UFO presentations is just absolutely wonderful. And uh, the audiences are really wonderful too because if it, if it wasn't for you folks, why uh, we wouldn't have anybody to tell about this stuff. So, uh, do you all know each other? I'd like you to do me another favor. Just take two seconds. Turn around to the neighbor next to you and say, Hi, I'm Mary, I'm John. Research in Space Technology, acronym FIRST, has been given some pieces of material from various individuals or groups that they would like analyzed. And I think that we've established sort of a scientific niche in the community and that we have, we have gained the trust of organizations and certain individuals who are willing to turn something over to us that they would not come up with before. And one of those pieces is a piece of material which we believe came from the Roswell crash site. So you're not only going to hear the, the info on what's going on with the implants, but I'm also going to take a little bit of time and, and tell you something about this piece of material. And also we have uh, the esteemed producer of the wonderful HBO movie Roswell, Paul Davids. And we'll bring up uh, Paul. Uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation uh, to give you some background and then he had some other things that he wanted to tell you and then we'll show you some slides of the piece of material and I'll tell you what we found so far with it. Now I have, as I said, a lot of material to cover so bear with me, we'll try and get it all done and uh, John, we'd like to uh, dim the lights and I put on, I'm going to open this up with a little videotape. It's a short video. Uh, just look at it and enjoy it. century has been answered. We are not alone. While producing the television special UFOs Above and Beyond, the producer made an astounding discovery. For the first time in history, 
hard evidence of extraterrestrial encounters was uncovered. Now, most of this material has undergone laboratory analysis, and the findings are astonishing. In 1947, the Army Air Force Base at Roswell, New Mexico, issued a press release announcing they had recovered a crashed flying saucer. The next day, the military retracted the story, saying the alien craft was a downed weather balloon. Despite the military's denial, eyewitnesses and recently declassified top secret documents confirmed the Roswell crash, but no tangible proof has ever been offered until now. Two military personnel present at the recovery site removed crash debris as proof of the incident. For fear of ridicule and reprisals, this material has remained a secret for over 40 years. The first piece of Roswell crash debris was released to scientists from the University of California at San Diego for metallurgic analysis. Isotopic ratio tests concluded the material was of extraterrestrial origin and did not come from Earth. Further analysis revealed the extraterrestrial metal was produced by a cold fusion process exceeding all known manufacturing technologies. Scientists have concluded the extraterrestrial material was not manufactured by man and was not produced on Earth. Similar crash debris was removed by a second military officer present at the Roswell impact site. Scientists at MIT, the world's leading metal sciences laboratory, conducted the scanning electron microscope analysis of this metal. The test results revealed a highly advanced manufacturing technology unknown to the world's leading metallurgists. When the debris was charged with electricity from a Van de Graaff generator, amazingly, the metal levitated. Physicists theorized the material produces its own electromagnetic gravitational field. No naturally occurring element or man-made metal is capable of producing a gravitational field. In April, funding provided by a national laboratory financed the first scientific investigation of alien abductions. Of the cases investigated, a hundred individuals were chosen to undergo medical examination. X-ray photography revealed foreign metallic objects located deep inside six individuals. On May 18th, a team of physicians performed surgery on two of the subjects. The first surgery removed two implants connected to the subject's nerve endings. Surgery performed on the second subject uncovered a similar object also attached to the nerve endings. Medical analysis revealed the objects were housed in biological jackets and had been surgically implanted. The surrounding tissue showed no signs of inflammation or scarring from a previous surgery. By medical standards, the absence of inflammation is impossible. Scanning electron microscopy conducted at Los Alamos Laboratory revealed an unknown biomechanical manufacturing process was used to connect the implants to the subject's nerve endings. A battery of tests for structural, chemical, mechanical, and electromagnetic analysis were conducted by New Mexico Tech Laboratory. Most of the metal present could only be referenced to extraterrestrial elements found in rare meteorites. Scientists concluded the implants were of extraterrestrial origin and could not have been manufactured on Earth. Unlike film or photos, metal structures and isotopic ratios cannot be altered. The evidence is overwhelming. The implications are staggering. In each case, the chain of evidence has been documented and the test results are conclusive. Now, for the first time in history, man has scientific proof. We are not alone. And can we have the house lights, please? Thank you. Well, as you can see, this was a teaser because it combined a lot of things and there's a number of different reasons why we made this little pilot. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, we anticipate uh, having a full-blown television uh, special done on this subject and maybe that will get some of the information out to the masses where it belongs. Any information that we glean from anything that I do uh, will go automatically. It belongs to the world. It belongs to you folks. It doesn't belong to me. 
and it should not be reserved for a particular group or, or person. So I show you this, just take this information I showed you, pack it away for a little bit, and I will go through the whole story. And since the majority of you have not heard my presentation before, I'll kind of have to go back to the semi-beginning. Don't worry, I won't go back into my childhood. Uh, back in uh, 1995, really 1995, uh, I was already uh, well entrenched uh, with uh, MUFON, uh, Ventura, Santa Barbara counties, and California. And uh, I had uh, become uh, sort of an unofficial writer for a publication out there called The Vortex. And uh, I wrote uh, a number of uh, columns. It's, it's a monthly uh, newsletter, and uh, I had been doing this uh, for some time and really enjoyed it. So it found me sort of in the position of uh, an investigative reporter. And when I think back to those days and what I've done this year, this year I've been all over the world. Daryl and I have been to just numerous countries. Uh, the medal I'm wearing is from the opening of the museum in Japan, Akui, Japan. And there's uh, three of us that are here tonight that had the distinct honor and privilege of opening that museum. And uh, I know that if, uh, if Walt were around when we do the presentations, he would be uh, well assured. And let me tell you now, Walt, that I have sung the praises of Mufon from uh, one end of this earth to, uh, to the other. So I am deeply indebted to Mufon for all the work that's been done so far. It not only got me started, but it gave me the impetus to continue. And if we were lucky enough to get the aliens and the scalpel published and John is working hard on it, it's going to tell the whole story of, of how it got there and what happened. So uh, back to 1995, uh, I was covering a, a UFO uh, convention, the UFO Expo West in California, and I met a 27-year researcher by the name of Daryl Sims. And Daryl had uh, investigated over 250 abduction cases and correlated a lot of data, uh, a lot of which I was not exposed to prior to this. He had uh, a set of x-rays of a foot uh, which contained two bright spots that look like metallic foreign bodies. Uh, he demonstrated these to me, I looked at them, and I said, well, you know, what's the big deal? It looks like the patient had a foot surgery, and when we do foot surgery, we put in lots of metal. We cut bones and put them together and straighten them out. Do we have any medical practitioners with us today? What's your field, sir? Great. We have a radiologist. So you know about all the garbage we put in during bone surgery. You've seen it pre-op, post-op, all the little screws, pins, nuts, plates, bolts, stuff that hold people together. So that's what this looked like, and uh, I wasn't impressed. So I kind of went on about my business, and I had our section director at that time call me back and said, I think you should hear what this fellow has to say. So I did. I went back and I showed me the x-rays again. And I said, well, why don't you have her foot surgery? And he said, well, she never had a foot surgery. And I said, yeah, she sure. So he says, would you like me to be able to prove that to your satisfaction? And I said, well, how are you going to do that? And he says, well, I'll show you all her medical records. And I said, well, that would be a help. So he reaches into this giant bag that Daryl carries with him uh, all over the world. It's a big giant case and holds out all medical records and he says, here. And I said, well, you mind if I take these to my room? Because I don't think I'm going to stand here and go through them. He says, take them away. Well, I did go through them and uh, it convinced me, at least as far as the medical record was concerned, that the patient had never had a surgery. So I went back to him the next day and I said, if there is a mystery about these objects, why don't you just take them out? See what they are. I mean, doesn't that sound logical? 
So uh, he said, well, that would be a wonderful idea, except that the patient doesn't have any medical insurance and she can't afford to do a surgery. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, would she be willing to come to California? The lady lived in Texas. And yeah. he said, yes, I think she would. And I said, well, you get her to California and I'll do the surgery without charge. And his eyes opened wide, and he said, do you really mean that? And then I said, I certainly do. He says, well, I hope you do. Would you come to my next presentation? And I said, yes, I'd be very happy to. So I did, and this was one of the cases he showed at this presentation, and he asked for someone in the audience who would be willing to foot the bill for the airfare to bring the patient to California. And by the time the presentation was finished, the transportation was provided. And he called me back up and he said, boy, I certainly hope that you're serious because now we have to print the transportation. And I said, I absolutely am serious. So over the next few weeks, we had numerous phone calls back and forth. And he asked me if I could accommodate doing a second case. And I said, well, what is this? And he says, I'll send you the x-rays, but I got another one of these in the hand. And I said, well, Daryl, I don't do hand surgery, but I can get somebody that would go ahead and do it if you like. And uh, I got some information from him on the phone. He sent me the x-rays. We took them to a radiologist, had them read, confirmed that there was what appeared to be metal substance in both the hand and the foot, and uh, prepared to do the two surgeries. So I, I set up a, a surgical team. And uh, on August the 19th of 1995, these first surgeries were performed. Now I'm going to go into some detail about the surgeries, and I'm, I'm not going to say anything that's going to be gory or you know, make you upset, especially after the wonderful dinner we had, <laughs> but uh, some of it might keep you awake. Now, <laughs> what... Um, Oh, I, I didn't tell you, I, I got uh, a number of slides. And we'll, when we get out of the slides, we'll go through the slides uh, rather rapidly, and then I'll show you some more of <laughs> the accidental video that you've forgotten to see. But you'll be all prepared for it by then. <laughs> so anyway, what we did was we uh, took the first patient with the two objects that you saw actually in the video here in the big toe of the left foot. And uh, Daryl used a uh, hypnoanesthesia. He's a certified hypnoanesthesiologist. And I came in with my syringe uh, filled with two kinds of anesthetic, a local anesthetic. It was composed of a long-acting anesthetic mixed with a quick-acting anesthetic. And we popped her, so to speak, put the toe to sleep. She did, she felt nothing, absolutely nothing, because she was already out with the hypnosis. So I, I tell you this, I want to impress upon you that she was gone for a particular reason, which you will see. So we went ahead, and uh, the next thing we did is we put a tourniquet, which looks like a rubber band, around the toe, and uh, we do that so we reduce the amount of blood flow so you can see what you're doing. And when you're doing a foreign body, it doesn't make any difference whether it's the hand or the face or the foot. If you don't have a lot of sophisticated equipment uh, to help you, it's a painstaking procedure. It's virtually like looking for a needle in a haystack. You look at the x-ray, and incidentally, we take them right before we do the procedure. You look at them, you pinpoint the area where you think it is, and then you go ahead and start looking for it, and you look, and you look, and you look, and you look. And you've got to have a little luck also because sometimes you don't see it for quite a while. So uh, we used the tourniquet to kind of uh, slow down the blood flow. Actually, we shut it off so the field is dry. And you can use uh, tourniquets like this in uh, various areas of the body. And you leave them on for the length of time, which is uh, medically appropriate and safe to do so. However, one of the cases that we did later on involved uh, an object uh, in the lower jaw and uh, we couldn't find a way to put a tourniquet around the neck. Uh, so, well, so it was uh, more messy than the others. Uh, you may see a little bit of that in the slides. So we went on, we made an incision and we went looking for something and it took us a while and uh, we probed the wound and when we touched something, 
The patient came out of the hypnoanesthesia, violently objected to what was going on, threw her foot up in the air, and screamed in pain. Well, that was quite a surprise because there was enough anesthesia in there to anesthetize the leg and with the hypnosis. So Daryl put her back down and kept saying, put some more blue and put some more blue. I don't know what that means, but whatever it is, it works. Anybody familiar with hypnosis? Oh, we've got a whole bunch over here. Are you awake? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, he kept saying, put some more blue on it, and finally got, uh, got her calmed down, and I put some more local anesthetic in, and we went ahead and uh, finally clamped the object and uh, removed it, at which she violently objected to that too. So to make a long story short, we took out a thing, like which I've never seen before in 30 some odd years of practice. Now, my specialty is feet. And you know, I probably really don't have to explain to you that people step on a lot of stuff. I've taken out hair, plastic, nail, metal, you name it, I've taken it out. Even took out some top secret super metal one time and I had to turn it over to some kind of a government agent who was right there with me in the operating room. And then probably 15 years later, I was told this is a gentleman that was machining a very new type of metal for rocket valves. I didn't find that out for 15 years. So I've taken out a lot of stuff, but I've never seen anything that looked like this thing. It was a T-shaped object, or a triangular-shaped object, or a star-shaped object, and all these things are in the eye of the beholder. And it measured about a half a centimeter in each direction and was covered by a very tight, gray, shiny membrane. Now, being uh, medically inclined and as much of a skeptic as anybody can possibly be about implants, I said, well, let's see what's inside. So I picked up the surgical blade and proceeded to try and cut it open and was flabbergasted because I couldn't cut it open. So I got a new surgical blade and tried again and I couldn't cut it open. And I handed it to my colleague, the general surgeon, and he tried to cut it open. So there's about 60 years worth of uh, surgical medical intervention and things, and neither one of us could cut it open. So for the sake of, sake of uh, good medical practice and surgical practice, we decided to forego taking a look at what was inside and go ahead and close up the patient. Now, I had researched the literature prior to doing anything like this because there were some tales about people who went and did this before, but they didn't come up with anything. You had all kinds of stories. Oh my gosh, it turned to vapor, it turned to powder, it turned to liquid, it disappeared, I dropped it in the dog ear. Everything that you could think of. But nobody had actually come up with anything. Not that this hasn't been done before. There's, there has been a couple of things that have been removed, but I don't think they turned out to be anything. So they didn't disappear. So I wanted to make sure that when I got the thing out, I could put it in something and be fairly safe. So I figured, well, what's safer than one's own biological fluid? And boy, we have a lot of biological fluid. We're about 90% fluid, over 90%. So I said, well, the most fluid we have is blood. So we took out some blood and we spun it down, which means we separated the liquid portion from the cellular portion, and then we mixed the liquid portion with a preservative and uh, an anticoagulant. And one time I said this and I got jumped over on by a medical person because he said the anticoagulant was in the tube. Okay, it was in the tube. So, uh, I stood corrected, so now I have to mention that every time I say that. But anyway, uh, it's stuff that will coagulate and it's preserved in and we pop the piece into there and uh, it seemed to rest quite nicely and after doing that for a couple of cases we decide that's the way to go, so that's what we do. Anything that comes out, we put it in our own biological fluid in the same manner. Then we went ahead to the opposite side of the toe and we had similar reactions that the patient objected. Now the only time I've ever known anything like this to happen is if you were working, let's say doing a nerve tumor and uh, you were excising or 
removing the tumor and you should pull on the nerve fiber itself sometimes outside the area of the anesthesia you may get a little pain or excitation but you can always put in a little higher anesthesia and it goes away uh, this is not that kind of reaction this is a very violent sort of reaction so we got that and uh, we removed an object that was a little uh, cantaloupe seed uh, shaped affair and uh, it was covered with guess what a shiny dark gray membrane so we said well we couldn't open the other one let's see if we can open this one so we took the old surgical blade and we tried to cut it open and we couldn't open it either so again it was uh, popped into the carrier solution and uh, we closed the patient up and went on to the hand case now this gentleman was kind of interesting the first lady or the first patient was a typical housewife type individual very nice very congenial kind of easy going and had just the most wonderful abduction scenario that you could ever hear it was like out of one of bud hopkins or ray fowler's books it was just really something but the second fella was a lot different. You remember Grizzly Adams from TV? I had him in my office. Came complete with coveralls and a big bushy beard. Probably said 19 words during the time he was there. One of the things he said when we came at him with the syringe to put the little anesthetic in his hand, he didn't have hypnosis. Oh, you don't need to do that. Doc, just cut it out. <laughs> well, we, we don't we don't operate that way. So <laughs> we we insisted that we you know give them a little schnapps or something. No, we can be giving that stuff. And we went ahead with him and uh, found uh, another little cantaloupe seed shaped affair down deep near the bone. And the first case, the both objects were down deep near the bone. So what's impressive though is that this little cantaloupe seed shaped object we took out of the gentleman was exactly the same as the one that we took out of the lady. And guess what it was covered with? A dark, gray, shiny membrane. We picked up a scalpel and guess what? We couldn't cut through that one either. So uh, we closed him up. Now both of these patients were examined by a psychologist prior to the surgery and after the surgery. We wanted to determine if they, of course, had any psychological abnormalities, and they didn't. They all performed just fine, but we also wanted to get their feelings, and I've been asked, did these things hurt? Well, interestingly enough, both of them were sort of discovered by accident, Neither one of them hurt until one week prior to the surgery. Now, I found that strange. Now, when the psychologist interviewed both of these individuals after the surgery, separately, one not talking to the other, they both told her almost the same thing. She says, how do you feel? Do you feel any different with this out, with the surgery over? And I said, I feel a newfound feeling of freedom. So I said to her, what does that mean? Does that mean that the apprehension from having the surgery is over and now they feel free? And she says, no, absolutely not. She says, I've never heard of anything like that before following a surgery. And she went into depth and in detail with these people. And we did follow them along quite some time after the surgery. We still, we still talk to them. And uh, we don't have enough time to get into all that, so I'm going to, I'm kind of capsulizing this stuff. Now, uh, what we did, we did without funds. No money. Everybody, the whole team, volunteered their time. I put up the funds for all the equipment. We used my office. But we realized that if we wanted to continue this research and, and, and progress, we would have to do something to raise some money. So Daryl and I formed uh, an organization which is non-profit called the Fund for Interactive Research in Space Technology, FIRST. 
and we tried to get uh, some funding from some various organized or personal sources because we knew that not only to continue doing the surgeries was going to be a costly business, but the analysis was going to be even more costly. Now, I did bring some things with me to the conference, which John was kind enough to put in the other room. We have two videotapes, we have uh, an audio tape, and we have some literature. Uh, if you purchase any of these things, that all goes in to FIRST. It's recycled through FIRST, and we appreciate it, and you have my, my personal appreciation for, for anything that you pur purchase in the bookstore, because that goes into, into the coffers so that we can continue this research. So the next thing we did was we sent the soft tissue, or the biological material, out for analysis. And that's when the more surprises began. First, I want to impress upon you that I sent out tissue that surrounded the object, not the dark, gray, thin, gray, you know, tough membrane, but the tissue that surrounded it. And when I got the first path reports back on that tissue, I was absolutely dumbfounded. Because one of the things we found was nerve proprioceptors. Now, nerve proprioceptors, you usually don't find down in the guts of a toe or the guts of an hand next to the bone. What would they be there for? Proprioceptors are little uh, special nerve endings. For example, you have them in the ends of your fingers for fine touch, for feeling, for pain. You know, when you put your finger on the hot stove, you know what happens. Come on, you know what happens. <laughs> what, you just leave it sit there and burn? No, the finger automatically goes up in the air and then you feel the pain. So that's an appropriate center for that particular uh, instance. We have them in the feet. It tells the muscles and the legs reflexly through the spinal cord how to contract. That's so when we walk back and forth. It's a, it's a continuous controlled movement and that's through proprioception. But what do they be doing down deep in, a, in the entrance of a toe or in the back of a hand or metacarpal? You know, they don't belong here. So that was surprise number one. Surprise number two was even more surprising because there was no evidence of any kind of an inflammatory response. Now, some people say, well, if it's been in there a long time, you're not going to get any inflammation. But that's not true. Anything that you get in the body that doesn't belong there, the body either is reacting to it or has reacted to it. So if you get a splinter into your finger and you let it sit there for a while and then you take it out and biopsy the tissue, you're going to see evidence of what's called an acute inflammatory reaction. You can see it under a microscope. You can see all the cells and these things going on. Then cells come in to sort of clean this material out. Now, if it's something that the body recognizes it can't get out, it has another way of dealing with, with it. For example, we have a lot of people with war wounds that have metal, they have shrapnel in them. Some had so much shrapnel in them, they call it a splatter effect. Couldn't operate on it. Too much stuff. They left it in there. No particular harm to the patient. But if you biopsy that 20, 30 years later, you would see evidence of what was a chronic inflammatory response. Because how does it stay in the body? Well, the body has a way of isolating it. Cells change and they make a fibrous membrane, not really a membrane, but a fibrous wall. Let's put it that way. A fibrous wall that walls this off and separates it from the rest of the body. So that's a chronic inflammatory response. Now you have other particular responses that go on in different parts of the body in specialized tissue in the liver and the lung. And since I've been doing this, I had to go back to the textbooks. I got on the computer and went through a few noted medical libraries and I found out another thing. They're not free, they charge you. You get on the net and you go on these libraries and they can get kind of expensive. But I, I was, uh, after I had this experience, you know, you, you begin to doubt things. You say, oh my gosh, I've been out of school a long time. Maybe the body changed. <laughs> I know mine has. So, 
you know, you, you doubt that, or maybe there's new stuff, you know, maybe things happen now and uh, there's a logical explanation for this. So, I, as I said, I looked through the literature and I got a, a modern copy of Robin's textbook on pathology and saw all the new stuff, and inflammatory responses and, and new stuff and foreign body tissue reactions and learned all about how the rejection reaction occurs with all the leukokinins and the various hormones that come into the area and it was quite an education. But I felt pretty good because I felt, well, gee, the same old body hasn't changed. We just know a little bit more about it. So things are the same way as I learned it. We still got two kinds of inflammatory reactions, either acute or chronic. So what are these two people doing with something in them, particularly metal, and there's no reaction? Kind of strange. So the next thing we were left with then was the dark, gray, shiny, well-organized membrane. So Daryl took these back to, uh, to Texas with him, and uh, with a chemist, first thing he did was to expose them to ultraviolet black light. Now why did we do that? Because we found in about uh, 5 to 15 percent of abductees, they have areas on their body following within five days after an abduction scenario that fluoresce under an ultraviolet black light. And we we advise the people that consult us that are involved with this phenomenon to check their bodies and see if they have any fluorescence. And it's very easy to do. You can make your own little black light. It's very, very inexpensive. Just check your body over. So we found that these objects fluoresced a very brilliant green, which happened to be the same color as what we found in some of the abductees, but there's more than green. Uh, the next thing that he did was he found that if he dried the objects out, it was able to scrape the membrane off the metal within. And he sent me that portion of the membrane back, and then I sent it out for analysis, and I got another shock. I said, oh my gosh, this thing is so tough. It's got to be, you know, there's got to be cartilage and all kinds of stuff that's probably grown in there. Well, we found out that it's only composed of three things. And I'll speak of this in terms of a bowl of jello. The first thing that it contains is what we call a protein coagulant, which means protein derived from clotted blood. And look at that in a bowl of clear jello, and we'll add a few things onto it. We'll put in some raisins in the jello. And these are composed of what we call hemosiderin granules. And we did an iron stain on these granules, and the iron stain showed that it was hemosiderin, in fact. What is hemosiderin? Hemosiderin is an oxygen-binding pigment, which is the cousin to hemoglobin. And hemoglobin, as you know, is in your red cells, and it is responsible for the oxygen-binding and transport mechanism to carry oxygen all over your body. Well, this is its cousin. And it's in, it's in this membrane. How did it get there? Who knows? And the third thing we found, that every lady in this audience will know what it is, because they spent thousands of dollars in a lifetime taking care of it. And it's called keratin. It's the outer layer of your skin. Forms your fingernails. Hair. Keratin. Down deep in the guts of a toe or a hand. And so you try and find logical explanations. And I talked to the pathologists on the phone, and they would give me, it's, oh, well, sure, what happened was you drag skin in there when you cut the thing open, being right under the skin, why, that's easily to do. And so this, well, it wasn't under the skin. It's down deep near the bone. And we didn't drag anything in. And three incisions, they all showed the same stuff. So what anyone ever came up with is a possible logical explanation that just didn't fit the bill. And of course, I guess I've saved the best for last because in these two cases that we did and the three different places that we found these objects, there was no opening in the skin. There was no portal of entry, no scar, no pimple, no nothing, honey, nothing. And we did a lot of looking because we took a loop and we looked high, white, and handsome because one in the hand, well, maybe it came in at the shoulder someplace and it worked its way down there because you hear a lot of that stuff too. Oh, it came from somewhere else. Somebody swallowed it, went out to the big toe. 
Well, as far as I know, we don't work that way. So, um, I will leave that at that and tell you that uh, we went on then to get some funding from an institution called the National Institute for Discovery Science, which is an organization headed by the billionaire Robert Bigelow, who some of you may have heard about, hate and detest. But with us, it was always a straightforward, uh, straight square shooting fella, and not only that, but he gave us money. Now, I'll tell you what I had to do, uh, which was kind of scary, and this, this presentation, you see, is also part of a confession that I have to make every once in a while. That's how I get through life. But uh, I had to do a presentation for NIDS, that's the, the acronym for National Institute of Discovery Science, and I had to do this presentation in a boardroom in front of the board of directors of NIDS, and the board of directors of NIDS is composed of some of the finest minds in the country, 16 top name scientists. Now I want you to try and picture this scenario. Here I am, this little foot doctor from Southern California and practiced for a few years, and my colleague, who is a certified hypnoanesthesiologist and abduction researcher, we're sitting in front of 16 top scientists in front of a horseshoe shaped table, you see? And uh, all these guys are sitting around the table, and then sitting behind them in the same semi-circle is their guests. And the first thing they do is they say, Mr. Sims, have a seat. And they put him in a chair, and they say, okay, doc, do it. And I have to convince these guys that they've got to give me money based on what I'm going to tell them. And they wouldn't know uh, a UFO from a, from a bug. Can I get hypnotized? Are you licensed to do that? I beg your pardon? Are you licensed or certified or whatever the word would be to hypnotize somebody? Are you a hypnotist? Am I a hypnotist? No. I don't do hypnosis. Daryl does. So is there someone here that can do that? Is there someone that can do this? Is Daryl here in the building? No. Daryl is in Texas. But I'd be happy to put you in touch with him if you are interested in that. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, what we're going to do now is to go on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this experience that I had here in front of these guys. Uh, one of the members of the board uh, was Jacques Vallée. And you all know Jacques Vallée. And uh, he was uh, very nice and, and very interested in what we were doing. In fact, he was really fascinated. It was the first time I had the pleasure of meeting him. He's a wonderful person. But anyway, I went ahead and I made this pitch, and I guess maybe the good Lord was smiling on me because uh, the plane was supposed to leave at 6 o'clock, and at 5.30 we were walking with Mr. Bigelow through the gardens of his palatial office discussing how we would turn over the specimens and how many. And we had to make certain arrangements with him and certain things pleased us and certain things didn't, but he promised us that the initial research uh, would be done in some of the finest laboratories and that we would get a scientific article and these things uh, have come to pass and are coming to pass. So I have nothing but fine things to say about their organization. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, save some of the uh, metallurgical analysis for a little bit later and uh, we'll go into the uh, second set of surgeries, which were three in number, and done on May the 18th of 1996. The two individuals, or three individuals involved, uh, two were ladies that had uh, each a left leg. That sounds strange. Yeah, they each had a left leg that had uh, a uh, radiological significant uh, object in it, which was uh, happened to be right below uh, an area of something that was on the skin. Now, you all know what scoop marks are? Okay, well, these ladies had uh, similar lesions, except they were not scoop marks, but if you remind me, I may have something to tell you about a scoop mark that may be sort of interesting. But anyway, uh, what we did here is we and the ladies decided to excise or remove everything. 
It took the skin and everything else down to the object that you could see on the x-ray, and the intent was to take it all out and then have it all analyzed. And that's what we did. Is that short and sweet? Okay. The third uh, individual was uh, a gentleman who had an object in the jaw, right near the jawbone, left-hand side. And for this, uh, we needed a specialized piece of equipment. So because we had a little bit of funding and a couple of bucks in our pocket, we were able to use a facility which cost $1,000 an hour for the surgery room, and then we paid an additional $600 for something else, and another $300 an hour for something else. And so it was a little more expensive than the first set of surgeries that it did. And we used an instrument called a fluoroscan. And with the fluoroscan, we were able to visualize on a television screen exactly where this thing was. And it made it a lot easier to get at and take out, and you'll see some of the slides that uh, we have with these procedures. We also decided to invite a number of dignitaries from all over the world, and they all came to watch this on a closed circuit television system. We had uh, videographers, these were all filmed uh, with a number of different cameras, including uh, close-up cameras. We had uh, people like uh, Whitley Strieber who were peering into the doorway, watching the surgery, becoming emotionally involved with the patients. Uh, we just had people from Japan, uh, just all over. They were, they were there to watch this uh, event happen, and it was very interesting. So, we went ahead, we used the floor scan, we visualized, and we took out a triangular shaped piece of what appeared to be metal from the jaw, and guess it was covered with? A dark, gray, shiny membrane. Now the other lesions, we took them all back to our little laboratory that we had there, and we looked at them, and we used the black light, and they all fluoresced. Again, we don't have all the reasons, but it, we, we are looking into finding out what causes this fluorescence. What, what are these fluorophosphors that make it fluoresce? Very rarely you take things out of the body. There can be things on the body that do normally fluoresce. Some fungus fluoresces. Some of the things that come out of our oceans fluoresce, but nothing that usually down deep in the tissue that fluoresces. So we took these things out and we put them in the same media and we went out and we did a more extensive pathology on the tissues surrounding the objects than we did the first time. Because one of the things we did, now we had a skin lesion too that we wanted to biopsy and see what it was. So for every procedure that we did, for every specimen that we removed, we divided it into three and we sent it out to three different laboratories we just told them it was a skin lesion involved with a foreign body. We didn't tell them what it was, didn't have anything to do with it. So all the laboratory results that we have, medical laboratories, pathological laboratories, or metallurgical laboratories, nobody has ever been told where the objects came from. As far as they knew, they could have come from the bottom of the sea or off of a tree. And that's the way we did it as a double spline study because we instituted controls. When we sent in these objects, we sent in objects that we knew what they were, and that's called a double blind. So I think uh, without further ado, we're going to uh, start the slides. pictures of Stonehenge and uh, I like Colin so I figure well, I'm going to get a sign that looks like Stonehenge. No, that's all lie. I'm not telling you the truth. What I had was a uh, friend of mine that uh, wanted to do me a favor and make some kind of a, a sign here to uh, start my uh, presentations by. So he made this and then he showed it to me and he said, well, what do you think of that? And I said, well, it's just gorgeous. Uh, but what has it got to do with implants? 
But he says, well, nothing, but uh, I thought you'd like it. And I said, yeah, oh, I like it, but gee, I wish I had something that had something to do with implants. And so <laughs> he made this one. Now, uh, one of the things that we're able to do is, you ever see uh, the police department that has the police artist and they have the sketches and the ready made, you know, noses and eyebrows and things? But we have a, a similar uh, situation for people that uh, want to identify the dude that was in their house at 4 o'clock in the morning that came through the wall and took the seven year old kid with them. And you can put uh, different pieces together, and it's a very interesting reaction to see when when someone actually gets one of these, and uh, they they feel it's the right person. They get a look on their their face, which you never forget. And I, I'll tell you, I had another experience this year. As I said, I was all over the world, and when you're talking to individuals who don't speak English, that have nobody to talk to. <coughs> They can't tell their parents, their brother, the people who work. They have no doctors, no psychologists, no books. And they start telling you stories. And there's hundreds of them. And tears run down their face. And their lips quiver. And some of them get so shaky they almost fall over. You know that something in the abduction phenomenon is real. Would you, would you judge that to be fear or happiness? Yeah, it's fear. It's deathly fear, and nobody to talk to. And when they start telling you, the first person that they talk to, and they're in a terrible state, acute state of emotional distress. And I was asked before, uh, do you have any of the implants? Uh, well, I don't carry them around with me, uh, but uh, here's some in a case that uh, Daryl carries around. And you can see they don't all look the same. They look, they look different. Uh, this is not an implant. And sometimes we carry around, or I don't, but Daryl does objects which have been given to us for analysis that are other than implants. Now, uh, here's some interesting uh, x-rays. Uh, you can see the object that's uh, right here and here and the toe. Here's another depiction of it, one on the other side, here and here. Uh, this was an interesting thing. This is a case uh, which came out of an eye and uh, it was analyzed at the University of Houston and the outer, it looks like kind of an egg or a shell. This uh, outer covering here uh, is composed of a very unusual ceramic material and the internal lining is soft. <coughs> and we've shown this to a number of different individuals trying to get opinions. And uh, one of the things they came up with is this could possibly be a housing for a biological camera. And we have another case right now that we're working up, and if it turns out to be what we think it is, it'll be one of these that looks exactly the same as this, except it's already attached to the retina. And we've got some, uh, some retinograms uh, to show that. Now, I noticed uh, this afternoon when I was uh, sitting over on this side of the room, I was, not unable, I was not able to see the slides. So if anybody wants to, to move over this way, I see there's kind of uh, a large amount of seats. I can just take just a minute. You can just go ahead and move over if you want to get a better view. Is this selector here is, I think, blocking a bit of it. Uh, this is a lady without a face. And she was the uh, first patient that we did in uh, August the 19th of 1995. Uh, I show you this only because it's a representation. Uh, a lot of folks uh, see, you know, surgery stuff on TV and they've got uh, uh, trays and, and drawers full of uh, hundreds of pieces of equipment. Well, this is some of the basic stuff that you just need to do a simple excision uh, of a foreign body that's uh, superficial or if you want to cut out a piece of skin. Not, don't need too much stuff. Now here I'm, uh, uh, see I didn't lie, I'm administering the anesthetic. Now we're applying this, uh, this is the tourniquet, you know, this is the kind that uh, some people would like me to put around their neck, but uh, we don't yep. do it.
Now we've uh, kind of got it open there and we're taking a look inside the tissue and you see, you don't see any uh, blood coming out. I did one of these where we used a pneumatic cuff around the uh, thigh of the patient uh, doing uh, foot surgery, working with a general surgeon that I'd never worked uh, with before. He came into the room late and we had this uh, sophisticated uh, cuff around the thigh and it was already draped. So I made an initial incision like this and I very carefully started dissecting the tissue and he kind of dug me with his elbow and he says, uh, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he says, it's not bleeding. And I said, yeah, that's true. And he said, uh, well, why is that? And I said, because I'm carefully cutting between the blood vessels. That's <laughs> real for you, huh? Yeah, and... <laughs> I never forgave myself for that. <laughs> but here you can see we're working. It's, it's quite a bit of work. There, there's the object. This is the first object, T-shaped object. And we've got uh, a little uh, isolated portion of it here. Here's a kind of a better view. It looks like a delta wing jet. So this person undoubtedly had a step on a jet. There's a, a good view of it. And you see how shiny this is right here? This is part of that uh, membrane. It goes all the way around the object. Now we're on the uh, other side. Why'd you cut it out? Why not leave it in? A big part? Why, why remove it? Why not just let it, you know, run its course? Run its course? Yeah. <laughs> well, after about 16 years, it didn't go run any further. <laughs> so, <laughs> especially in the foot. Now there's the little uh, cantaloupe seed shape one. You can't see uh, too much definition in these photographs, but I got some others. There's a good one. Now when you see this, I won't tell you uh, which one this is. Only I know. One of the things about a Bard Parker blade, that's the, the knife handle that holds the blade, is it has a measuring device, and you can get a gross measurement of the object. This is uh, Grizzly with a happy face. And no beard, you see, I wasn't exaggerating. And uh, we're, we're pushing on the hand, and you see this thing up here? This is uh, ethyl chloride, it's a refrigerant. So we spray this onto the skin, and we kind of freeze it before we go in with a needle. But remember, this is a tough guy, and he's trying to shove your hand away while you're doing this. Now, what are we doing here? How come we got two of these in here? Well, this is not for the purpose of putting in anesthetic. It's for the purpose of triangulating. Uh, to try and find the object and we were going to make our incision between the two needles. And we've begun. Uh-huh. Looks like something came out. By golly, there it is. Now, uh, these slides are kind of unusual because they were made from a computer. I didn't even know that process was possible, but I'm learning a lot about a lot of things here. And with the computer, you see, you can put little circles around and things to show people where they are. Doesn't this kind of look a little bit like the one we took out of the toe? We'll see as we go on. Look at that. Yeah. Doesn't that look like the one that came out of the toe? Remember what that one looked like? Which one is that? Any guesses? Oh. Foot or hand? Foot. Yeah. Foot. The foot people win. Now, these were some of the individuals that were present. You may recognize Bob Dean, that's Daryl. This is Michael Lindemann and his wife, Deborah. Uh, this is our chief uh, investigator from the great state of Texas, Dale Musser. 
And I don't know who that guy is. He's just hanging around, I guess. Yeah, clone, clone. No more twins, they're clones. Now this is Daryl, and you can see he's comfortable. Tell her to put blue in it already. What are we doing here? Well, we're not giving an injection, and uh, this is another reason for using a tourniquet. You use that when you draw blood. And so we're taking out our media that we're gonna put the uh, specimens in. And this is uh, one of the uh, objects that we're gonna excise. And we'll kind of uh, race through these to conserve time. Because right after I show you these, I'm gonna show you some live action. These are what some of the pieces look like when we've taken out the skin and everything below. Now Daryl's doing his thing. I, uh, I have to uh, hope John is watching. I bet John's watching the time. Um, <coughs> Daryl uh, did a hypnoanesthesia on this case. Uh, guess what? This patient was allergic to all local anesthesia. Couldn't use local at all. So he had to do it with straight hypnoanesthesia. So I meant, boy, he put a lot of blue in her because when she came in the room, she was stoned. I mean, this gal was out. Now, the, my colleague that I worked with uh, on this case uh, was not the same colleague that I'd worked with on the first two cases. And uh, this young feller uh, never did a surgery with a hypnoanesthesia before. So uh, we got going here, and uh, he made the initial incision, and then they went to kind of lift out the flap. And you know, people think of surgeons, ah, oh, they're cold and callous, they get in there and cut you up and then they go home and have dinner, hot dogs and stuff. But they really, most surgeons really have a, a great concern for the patient. And so when you do that, you get into habits. And so when he was ready to lift out this piece of tissue, which you sometimes do with a local, he said to her, this may hurt, dear. Let me tell you. You don't say that to anybody that's under hypnosis. It did hurt. And he stays there and uh, uh, right through the surgery uh, works with the patient. something out because we're closing it already. Hey, there it is. Now, this uh, device is the uh, Fluoroscan, as our radiologist present will <coughs> call what they look like. However, it's in a very peculiar position here. But the slide is right side up. Now, here's a couple of views of plain, ordinary x-ray. And uh, here's the object. Another view. What's this? So uh, one of Colin Andrews' uh, maps that he drew the crop circle. No, that's that's a marker. Here's another picture of the flora scan. You see, you put the part between these uh, two ends here, and then you watch it on this television screen here. You know how we always call it the part. Sure. No matter where it is, it's the part. Now this is real anesthesia. This is real injectable anesthesia. You see what happens when you don't put that tourniquet around the neck? It bleeds and the patient stays alive. Now, uh, this is an interesting little gadget. This is called a self-retaining retractor, and uh, it adds another uh, hand to the batch because it has a little jaws here, and you insert the jaws in the incision, you give this a squeeze, it has a little lock on it, and it keeps the tissue separated for you. Again, we're using the uh, Flores Cam to get an idea of where we're gonna go with this. And uh, we're looking at the TV screen. And there's another shot of it. Here we've uh, put in a, uh, a syringe, just a needle again, 
and then the object is right in here. And it's out. And uh, when we got it out, we had to make sure that piece had the metallic portion in it. So we put it through the floor scan again and uh, took a look and then we were able to visualize it and know that we got it out. And if you look closely here, you can see where the metallic portion is right in the middle of this piece of tissue. I don't know, can we focus that any better? That's, that's good, thank you. And there's another view. Now these are some of the specimens that we removed. Some of them you're seeing from the inside out. We take them back to the laboratory, which is uh, in the complex that we use, and uh, we dissect them apart uh, using uh, a blade and a needle and a little forceps. It doesn't take a lot of instrumentation. We take a measurement. And then here's the solution I was telling you about. It's in this tube and the object with the skin and everything else has been placed in here. That's what I look like at the end of the day. <laughs> this is a, a camera with a, a lens on it that takes very close up pictures. You can see how close the object is to the lens of the camera. This is a ultraviolet black light. Unfortunately, we can't demonstrate the fluorescence because the camera won't pick it up. So what we had to do here is just kind of simulate it with the light on and the specimen so that we can get the picture. These are some individuals that were visiting. This fellow came from uh, Japan and uh, He's the curator of the uh, Hakui uh, Cosmo Isle Museum there. One of our camera people. This is what the membrane looks like under the microscope. This is, this is the jello protein coagulum. These are hemosiderin granules. And this is the character. When we did the, uh, the pathology on the, the three cases that I did in May, we got some interesting uh, findings because I told you we were dealing with a lesion that was also on the skin. Uh, here the lesion showed minimal chronic inflammation, but again, large nerve bundles, uh, no hemosiderin, we didn't expect to see any, and there was some fibrosis in the area. And that, I believe, had to do with the skin lesion itself. This is the left calf, uh, benign skin with, uh, with minimal uh, changes going on, uh, chronic inflammation and orthokeratosis. This is uh, more normal type findings. But when you sum it all up, you have still some unusual things because you have all these different things. And I want you to take particular note of this one. Solar elastosis. Solar elastosis means that there is an irradiation of the dermis, which is the deep layer of the skin, to a large amount of ultraviolet. Now these two ladies were not in the habit of going out gardening, laying on the beach, or having prolonged exposure to sunlight. Uh, they were basically had a very pale white skin, and have been that way most of their lives. Anyway, what is one tiny little part of the anatomy of the leg doing with a reaction to ultraviolet light? So just keep that in mind for a minute. Here's another one, solar elastosis. Uh, focal blood vessel lumen obliteration, that means there's a change in the blood vessels. We have hemosiderin deposition, chronic inflammation, again, nerve tissue, and fibrosis. 
Skin left calf, fibrosis with, what do we got here? Solar elastosis again. In the summary, you see some of the similar things. Remember, these are different people. Solar elastosis, no foreign body reaction. Remember, these have little white, grayish white balls about the size of a BB that's attached to this thing on the skin. No evidence of inflammation, nerve tissue present again, and no hemocytorin, which we didn't expect to find in the first place. Summary, <clears throat> we have uh, no inflammation, no chronic inflammation, and no uh, histologic foreign body reaction. Again, no evidence of inflammation. Now, we're gonna, I think maybe we could focus this a little bit better. When you uh, look at the metallic objects uh, under the electron microscope, it uh, blows them up to a great deal. This is the uh, cross member of the T-shaped object. And uh, I want you to look at certain little things here. One, if you look at this end, you can see it's flattened like a bullet. And this end has this uh, thing, this structure on it. Does that remind you of anything? Anybody got any ideas? A barb. A barb. Who said that? Very good, because that's what it reminds me of. And when you stop and think about that, what better way to anchor something in the tissue than to have a structure like this, a barb, because when it's in there, it won't move. And, uh, you know, if you go fishing and you're trying to hook a fish, you got that little barb in, boy, the poor fish can't get it out of his mouth. And then if we look at one other little interesting point here, we'll see this, what I call a Dell in the bottom. Well, guess what went in here? The vertical portion fit just beautifully in here, and I'll show it to you in a minute. Now, this is like looking at another world. This is called cladding, and it's a elemental composition that covers the outside of an object which the core is a ferromagnetic rod made of iron carbide which is harder than the finest steel that we use for anything known to man and it's magnetic so this is kind of a tour through three sections of cladding you see this stuff any guesses on that this is what's left of the soft tissue that's clinging to the object. And it evidently anchors into these little tiny holes here. Now, here's the other portion. Look at this end. You remember the Dell that I showed you in the horizontal rod? Well, this just happens to fit nicely in there. Now, one of the things is when you separate these two objects, you put them in a little uh, container, uh, they will stay apart momentarily and then they'll just come slamming back together again. And this does not have a solid iron core. It has a soft core made of carbon and is magnetoconductive. Again, looks like another world. These are what? Crystals. Somebody say crystals? crystals. This, there's a crystalline band that goes all the way around this thing. <coughs> you know, and we have an electrical engineer that's working with us, and he's come up with some interesting theories. But if you take something that's a solid iron ferromagnetic rod, and you have a complex cladding that's around it, and then you add a, a carbon structure to it, is there anybody here that remembers a crystal set? Electric yeah, one of the most basic forms of radio communication was just simply a crystal, a battery, and a coil. And if this is a sophisticated device, which we believe it is, there are some similarities. Now, uh, here's just a, a throw-in case. I don't know if you can focus that any better or not. This is another case we're working on. Nobody has seen this yet. You're the first audience that ever saw this. 
You know, uh, through the years in the literature, there's been a lot of reports of abductees, female abductees, who said they were pregnant and not by their husbands or by the boyfriend. They were pregnant, perhaps, by an alien impregnation. And whenever someone goes to try and prove one of these cases, there's no fetus, there's no baby, there's no blood, there's no ultrasound scans that have ever been done. So it's just a dead end. This was a case in which one of these things may have happened, and the individual that was involved stole this ultrasonogram out of the hospital. She later went through a terrible series of events in which the baby was delivered supposedly at four months. A fully constructed baby. She was not allowed to see the baby. The baby was taken away from her. She was heavily sedated and taken home. She's never seen the baby again since. Well, it's a long story, and I'm sure that John would not give me the time, because it would probably take the rest of the night. But here, here's the fetus. And uh, we took these, uh, these pictures to uh, England with us, and uh, we went to a fetal medicine group over there, which is the finest in the world, and they said, is this something normal? Are these fetograms normal? Or did you find anything unusual here? And they gave us some very interesting answers. And I saved this one to last because this is the head. This is the head. And in the pictures, you can see that there are what appears to be eye sockets here. Does this appear at all unusual? And here's the uh, four pictures, all on the same slide. So it's a case of progress. We haven't determined whether this is it or whether this is not it, but we're working on it. And I just showed you this because it kind of leads into the, the Roswell event. And uh, if we can have the house lights up, And we'll leave that slide right there and just shut off the machine. And then I will ask uh, Paul Davis to be so kind to come up here and, and give us the uh, very important information. Thank you, Paul. Roger, thank you for an absolutely excellent presentation. I know he's not finished, but can we have a hand for Roger? I live in Los Angeles. I'm a graduate of Princeton University in psychology. I've worked in the motion picture business for over 20 years. 19, February of 1987, I had a very clear daylight disc sighting from my home, uh, four or five miles from Pasadena with my two children, which turned around my lifelong skepticism and debunking on the subject of uh, flying saucers overnight. And uh, in 1993, after four years of work and preparation, I executive produced uh, the film Roswell, which I had co-written, which we began developing at HBO. People have referred to it as an HBO movie, and they were involved at first, but then it was made for Showtime. Um, perhaps a lot of you have seen it. Those who haven't can easily find it on videotape. It's the film called Roswell with a subtitle in the video called The UFO Cover-Up, starring Kyle MacLachlan and Martin Sheen and Dwight Yoakam. Uh, I made the film uh, quite persuaded that the Roswell crash had been an extraterrestrial event based on years of research and very close work with Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt. Several trips to Roswell with them following closely the whole development of their first book, UFO Crash at Roswell. I became involved with the rights to that book when it was a 17-page outline and they had no publisher. And we made a, a very little deal uh, for me to have an option to try to develop it, make it as a film. And it took years, as I say. It became a much bigger deal when big companies got involved. And I'm very, very gratified that the world has seen it 
and knows about the Roswell incident through the type of story we tried to tell, which was to bring it down to the human level of the military officers and the psychological strain, conflict that they went through in uh, being in a situation of having to withhold information for many, many years and finding themselves sort of hung out to dry when they came forward with the information. I applaud Kevin uh, and his co-author for the work they did on that project and the UFO, uh, truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, which they wrote subsequently. And Kevin, who's with us tonight and will speak tomorrow, has become one of the best and one of the most prolific authors in the UFO field, in my opinion, and I commend to all of you uh, his book, The Randall Report, and his new one on Project Blue Book. I became uh, involved in the issue that Dr. Roger Lear raised about possible debris from the Roswell crash. It was called to my attention by another television producer named Chris Wyatt. Roswell's 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary of the crash was coming up. I was scheduled to make a presentation there. And within the months before planning that presentation, uh, Chris got together with me and explained to me about this particular piece of debris that had undergone uh, complex analysis of several different types from several different respected laboratories. And uh, I said, even though the work wasn't absolutely complete at that point, that I thought that it should be publicly presented at this phase. People should be made aware of it. And then they could follow the continuing research as there was more information to be released about it later down the line. I remember a lunch that Chris Wyatt and I had together where he brought together a binder this thick with all the different laboratory reports, all the different results, the studies that had been done on this one particular piece of metal. And he said to me, Paul, I uh, blocked out some of the names of the binder I'm showing to you. Um, there are some people and some laboratories that are not willing to come forward yet in association with this research. We hope and we think that they will a little further down the line. They'd like to publish peer-reviewed journal. And they don't want to be part of any hoopla or public uh, Barnum and Bailey kind of antics that might accompany the presentation of the material uh, at this stage, pre-publication. So, I was put under a constraint uh, that I wasn't able to divulge the names of all the various laboratories involved, but I, I certainly recognized a major university uh, that had been involved in finding the specific lab to run a certain type of confirming isotopic analysis study on the material. A preliminary set of isotopic uh, ratio analysis has already been done by Dr. Russell Vernon Clark who has a PhD in chemistry from the University of California, San Diego, who works as a chemist at that university, dealing with uh, ecological issues in the chemistry department. I learned that Dr. Russell Vernon Clark was going to be willing to present his findings on this piece of material uh, at Roswell, and I sponsored this presentation of information by uh, by flying in Dr. Russell Vernon Clark, Daryl Sims, Dr. Roger Lear, and Chris Wyatt came as well as someone who had been working to try to put together a television presentation of material. The short form summary of what was found about this piece of debris was that it consisted of uh, four elements, and uh, almost all of it was silicon. <coughs> And uh, there was zinc, nickel. Was there silver involved? Was it five? Silver. And the finding that it was germanium was later changed to the arsenic. One of the items that was germanium items that was arsenic. All right. Uh, but the silicon was the vast majority of what was present. And some of these others elements were present and in parts per billion as a, a sort of impurity within 
the silicon. And the findings of Dr. Russell Vernon Clark and the second confirming findings from the other laboratory connected with the major university were that the isotopic ratios for every single one of these elements was completely out of whack with what you would find with the elements as they appear on Earth. Now, um, I've, I've explain what you mean by the term isotopic ratio. For every element on the periodic table, um, the um, you know, the nucleus has a certain number of, of, of neutrons. You're going to go into the, the, the detail. Carbon, silicon, all these different uh, atoms exist in different kinds of forms um, called isotopes. And the ratio of one form to another is pretty consistent anywhere on Earth. If you took um, carbon that you found from the Andes and compared it with the Himalayas, compared it to uh, carbon that you found under the ice of Antarctica. It's all going to be within range of each other to the ratio of the one isotope of carbon to another isotope of carbon. But with these elements that were present, this, they were all completely out of whack with it, what you would find on Earth for each one of these elements. Now, what was also really interesting to me, with some of it as parts per billion, um, well, that's an extraordinary thing to think about, but if, if this had somehow been manufactured on Earth, because we can manufacture um, silicon in, in different isotopic ratios, you can produce one, you can produce another, the mix of this and the trace elements in the parts per billion was really staggering. Dr. Russell Vernon Clark as a chemist could not conceive of any way that this could have been manufactured on Earth with the technology that we have right now. And there were no impurities detected by any laboratory of elements that are in the Earth isotopic ratios. If somehow some laboratory had tried some way to try to create something like this, you can imagine somewhere along the line some sort of impurity would have been introduced in the system so that you would find something from the laboratory, some carbon, some oxygen, something in the earth isotopic ratios, and that wasn't there. Dr. Russell Rand Clark also reported that the material, by every measure that he could make, and I believe this was seconded by one of the laboratories in, in, in Texas, appeared to be manufactured. It's extraordinary information. This doesn't make it from the Roswell crash. And please understand me, I don't know that this was from the Roswell crash. I personally don't have ev any evidence that it was. I only have uh, the word for that of Daryl Sims and the person who provided him the material. And a story that's very incomplete for me about who actually supposedly took this from the Roswell debris field. That's an untold story as far as I'm concerned, and I hope it's going to come out and going to come out soon. And, and I, I think that it, it probably will. I think that the people involved are willing to, to do that. But I can't tell you I know for sure that it's from Roswell, or from Kecksburg, or from Rendlesham Forest, the Bentwater Street, or from uh, some defense laboratory like Lockheed that may have been working on studying this material years after the fact, whether it was taken there, I don't know. But it is purported that it comes from the crash. And the findings were extraterrestrial in origin and manufactured. And for that, you need extraterrestrials who manufacture it. Now, in introducing this information to the world in Roswell, what happened to us, what the reaction was, is almost as interesting as the findings. Because the, the press was scathing in its reaction to this declaration. And it took the very claim, the very declaration that this was the case, as 
preposterous outrage and pretension that couldn't possibly be true. Skeptic Carl Sagan, in uh, his last uh, major work, The Demon Haunted World, which is a sort of skeptic's Bible on this whole subject of UFOs, uh, talks about the, the implants, for example, <coughs> criticizing implant work. Let me just back off one second and say, I, I recommend to all of you that you read Demon Haunted World as the most ferocious attack on ufology that I've ever seen. I vehemently disagree with 90% of what Carl Sagan has to say about uh, uh, ufology in this book, while agreeing with a great deal of what he has to say about some of the other examples that he calls pseudoscience. And this book is a challenge to us because I don't know where the communication has, has broken down with, a, with an extraordinary man and mind and visionary in many respects like Carl Sagan who said of this subject, there's, there's no evidence. And his book shows absolutely no awareness of evidence. I know this is a digression, but I want to take 60 seconds and just finish it. You saw incredible examples of landing trace cases today. You heard Walt Anderson's presentation first thing in the morning. Uh, he went into great detail about that. And you heard about the Rendlesham Forest trace cases on the ground. What Carl Sagan says about that kind of evidence, some enthusiasts argue that there are thousands of cases of disturbed soil where UFOs supposedly landed. And why isn't that good enough evidence? It isn't good enough because there are ways of disturbing the soil other than by aliens and UFOs. Humans with shovels is a possibility that springs readily to mind. He rejects all the land and trace evidence because a human can disturb soil with a shovel. And regarding implants, such as Dr. Lear's work, he says, a few such implants have been produced and examined by experts. None has been confirmed as of unearthly manufacture. No components are made of unusual isotopes, despite the fact that other stars and other worlds are known to be constituted of different isotopic proportions than the Earth. Now, with the debris from Roswell, we gave the scientific community what Carl Sagan was asking for here. This unusual piece of debris with extraordinary non-earthly isotopic ratios in five elements, and it wasn't good enough for them. We were scathingly denounced. One or two newspapers, the Albuquerque Journal the following morning gave a fair summary of the presentation, and so did the Roswell Daily Record. Um, but other newspapers talked about how the presentation had crashed into Harmon and Roswell, and there were scathing denunciations from Associated Press. The way Associated Press dealt with this information was to release a story that was published in 60 newspapers. And I know this because I've, with Burrell's clipping service, I've got all 60 clippings. With every story, there's a large, you know, sort of headline or sub headline, as uh, they would call it. And there's photos, with most of them. Call attention to it. And they describe the, the Roswell Circus in Barnum and Bailey terms, the 50th. And they mention that there was this presentation by a man who purported to be a chemist from the University of California, San Diego, Dr. Russell Vernon Clark, who claimed that he had debris from the Roswell crash that had proven to be extraterrestrial in origin. They said, but a check with the university has confirmed that Dr. Russell Vernon Clark doesn't work for them. End of story. They said the man lied about his place of employment. No point in pursuing that any further. And they followed that paragraph with a paragraph that said, and in talking to skeptic Philip Class about the matter, he said, in any event, anyone who believes UFOs, it's like believing in Santa Claus. That's the way Associated Press in this country dealt with this extremely serious scientific research. And we said to them, how dare you say he doesn't work for the University of California in San Diego? How dare you print 
that and demean the man and harm the man's reputation for the crime of coming forward with some scientific results that are controversial. And so they agreed to print a retraction. And Burrells has sent me copies of all the newspapers that printed that, react, uh, that retraction. They've sent me copies from both of the newspapers that printed it. It appeared as a tiny little paragraph in two newspapers out of the 60s. I think that there's a whole lot more to be told about the story. Um, and that it's a really intriguing, interesting, and important finding. And uh, it's a shame that that's the way the public uh, media has dealt with it today. But it's typical. This is not a level playing field. These ideas you're hearing about this conference are largely unacceptable to the mainstream establishment. You won't read about any of this in, a, in an unbiased way in the New York Times, Washington Post, careful Associated Press. Nor will you hear about it in an unbiased way from the establishment uh, news shows. Once in a while, something in Hollywood sort of slips through the system, like Roswell did, moving, that brings this information to the public in a way that has an impact. But for all of us who are trying to do it out there, the uh, deck of cards is stacked against us at every, every step of the way. And I'm still trying to do it with some other projects. And uh, continuing to hope that we can bring more of the information to you. Um, I thank Roger for having involved me in the information about the uh, piece of purported uh, Roswell debris. And I commend all of those, including Dr. Russell Bernie Clark, who've been involved in their research. So uh, that's what I have to say for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. make a, a final comment about the implants and then I'll go back and finish with the Roswell piece to detail. What am I going to do with this stuff? You know, what are, what are we doing? The best that we're going to be able to do is to say if all works out as it seemingly seems like it's going to work out, is that in cases of alien abduction, those individuals who we've removed some substances from their body and carefully analyzed them, and the results are being published in a scientific peer-reviewed journal, that ultimately we can say that those that report alien abduction experiences that have objects in them that seem not to be made of this earth. And I think that if we can do this, it will do more than to give scientific reality to maybe millions and millions of people that are undergoing the alien abduction phenomenon and are being sometimes terrorized by it. Would you like that? Now, in addition, as I said, we, we get various things turned into us, and uh, Paul was a little bit hamstrung when it came to this press conference because he wasn't privy to the knowledge of how we obtained this piece. A piece was given to us by someone that Daryl and I knew, and he had gotten it from another individual in a large money exchange. He was convinced that it came from Roswell and that it was unusual, and on that basis, he lent a big sum of money. The individual that he obtained it from got it from the Roswell crash site. 
But that individual wouldn't release any information to us because he sat in dire fear. Not only fear that something would be done to him, but fear that we would release information. So what we have done is we, I believe, have completed our part of the agreement. We have not violated that, even to the extent of perhaps not giving the information that people would like to have heard on the day of the press conference. Now, I think that we've demonstrated that pretty well because on the day, the same day, or the day before that I left to come here, I got new information on the individual and his family. And so we are now, I believe, going to be uh, open to acquiring the rest of the information that I believe will trace this piece back to Roswell. Now, as far as the, the uh, analysis is concerned, uh, Paul uh, told you the major story. It's 99.9% .9 pure silicone. But that is not the end of the story because the ratios of the silicone are not earthly ratios. They're extraterrestrial ratios. They don't come from here. And an isotope, for example, if you dig iron anywhere on the earth, you will find it's composed of two kinds of iron, what we call ferric iron and ferrous iron. And it means you're two different types of molecules with a difference in the number of electrons that spin about the nucleus. And when you combine these together, you get the element iron. Anywhere on Earth that you dig iron, the iron ratio of ferrous to ferric iron is going to be the same within 2%. If iron comes from somewhere else, it may not be the same. It doesn't mean that it won't be the same, but it may not be the same. So how do we know, for example, that the organic substance found in the meteorite that supposedly came from Mars came from Mars? That's how. We know because of some of the elemental substances in that composition of that meteorite were the same as what we had analyzed previously from Martian samples. So we could peg this rock to Mars, just as we have pieces of the moon. We can peg isotopic ratios in a number of different elements and say this is the difference, this came from the moon. So uh, when we look at this, we find that every, as Paul mentioned, every single element that's in this. So it's 99.9% uh, silicon. Now we have 0.1% uh, then uh, trace metals of nickel, uh, zinc, silver, uh, and germanium. One of the things that happened following the press conference was that all this information got onto the net. And I have never found so many armchair scientists in my life. Everybody that ever read a book on physics or elemental chemistry was hitting the internet and they were just tearing us up one side and down the other. And poor uh, Dr. Clark, Vernon Clark, was uh, just getting all sorts of uh, beleaguering email and uh, criticism. But amongst all this information was some worldwide attention from some very renowned physicists. So we've got a lot of people now in a clique and it's a closed clique because nobody's going to be privy to it anymore except the scientists. They only uh, will let me, they only contact me when they've decided what they're going to do. But one of the things that happened was that uh, Dr. Clark took this uh, substance back into the laboratory and uh, recalculated uh, some of the uh, mathematics that had to do with uh, calculating the ratios. And what he found was that one of the objections was to germanium-75, who theoretically exists only for such a short period of time that it wouldn't be around long enough to be in a stable compound. Well, he found out that what, because of the mathematical recalculation, that germanium-75 was not germanium-75, but was indeed arsenic. So we have another, comp we have another element that's added uh, to this mystery. But the arsenic in itself is a very unusual isotopic ratio. Now if we could get the uh, slides back on, I'll give you a slight tour through the object. 
This was uh, looked at by um, three uh, different laboratories to date. Uh, one was the University of California in San Diego. Another was another major university complex in California. Another was a laboratory in Dallas. Another one was a, uh, a recent test was run by a laboratory in Canada. So far, three of them have confirmed that the isotopic ratios uh, in this model are of extraterrestrial origin. And the, uh, the, the other one, uh, the Canadian University, or the Canadian laboratory, I should say, uh, was not conclusive, and it was not conclusive and not because it isn't so, it's because of the type of test that they ran. Uh, what, uh, what was not mentioned so far is uh, two things. Uh, one was manufacturing structure, and the other was an eyewitness. Uh, when we were in Japan, uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. was there, and we pulled out this object and put it into his hand, and said, look what we have. You find this interesting? And, I mean, we physically saw the eyes bulge out of his head. And we said, have you seen anything like that before? We didn't tell him what it was. We didn't suggest that it was from Roswell or from anywhere else. And he said, I think I have. And I said, well, where did you see this before? He said, I think I saw this on my kitchen floor when my dad brought the debris in. There was a bunch of black material, which I call Bakelite. And if you look at this in, in certain uh, certain views, this, this is not it, this is another substance. But if you look at it in uh, certain views, uh, you will uh, see that it looks uh, almost black. Uh, this is another piece that was given to us, a uh, very unusual piece. Uh, if you take this uh, little uh, rock or whatever it may be, uh, at room temperature, and you put it in your hand, it's ice cold. If you take this and then you put it on a, an ice cube, in 90 seconds it'll melt through the ice cube. And speaking of landing traces, this was taken from a uh, landing trace site in Israel. This is a, a view of the Roswell piece. And you see it has the certain surfaces. They do not look the same. What are the dimensions, Roger? Yeah. Uh, I would have to guess about uh, an inch across in each dimension. Uh, one of the, the uh, areas that I wanted to show you here, which I don't particularly have it in the slide, No, I don't have it. But if you uh, if you look at this thing, you can see that it has, uh, and you don't have to measure, you can use your eye, but you can see that it has two curvatures. And uh, these two curvatures do not occur naturally. Uh, these are manufactured. And one side of this is just as uh, smooth as it could possibly be, and it's if it has been machined. Uh, we've also shown this uh, this piece to uh, several uh, individuals in both uh, the nuclear physics labs and in metallurgy, and they say that there's good indications that the temperature that this piece has been put through has been in the millions of degrees. Now, if you take this piece and you hold it uh, with your fingers and you put it into a glass of ice water, in about uh, 10, 15 seconds, it gets so cold that you have to drop it. You can't hold on to it. Conversely, if you take the piece and you put it into liquid about the temperature of drinkable tea, it will get so hot, again, you can't hold it. You have to drop it. So it seems not only to conduct hot and cold, but amplify it. So it has some, some interesting physical characteristics. Now, uh, that completes my presentation on the Roswell piece, and for the very last thing, uh, I will uh, read to you uh, a little bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll just let me read a little bit on the analysis, and then we'll show a little bit of the surgery. 
Uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, this is a letter uh, of opinion that came from New Mexico Tech. Remember I told you that all the implants were, uh, were double-blinded. The laboratory uh, did not know uh, where these implants came from. They didn't know they could have come out of a, a fish's mouth. Uh, the first theory on the origin of these samples was initiated due to the relatively high hardness value obtained for the iron core. Remember I told you you had an iron core? Uh, it is well known that hard al iron alloys can be found naturally in meteorite samples. In fact, several characteristics of the specimens are different elements. This is the case particularly for sample G3, which contains at least 11 different elements. Typical of an iron stony iron meteorite is the classic Wyndham structure consisting of lamellae or needle-shaped crystals of camasite. These are formed during the slow cooling of meteoroids. Interspersed with the metal grains are other minerals which are rich in iron or nickel, nickel such as troilite, triversite. Based on my examination, the samples in question could possibly fit into this framework. Elemental analysis done by X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy indicated the iron and phosphorus as major constituents of the cladding. That's the stuff on the outside. And the material surrounding the iron core. The uh, patterns resemble those recently reported for iron dendrites found in pockets and veins of the young Schwang 116 meteorite. In addition, I identified a calcium phosphate mineral as a possible phase within the cladding of both samples. Interesting, chloropatite is among the more common meteorite minerals. This would account for the presence of substantial amount of calcium and smaller amount of chlorine detected. A problem with this theory, catch this, however, is that no nickel was detected in T1 and T2 and only a minute amount in T3. It has been stated that most meteorites contain between 6 and 10% nickel. No iron meteorites contain less than 5% nickel. Then he comes back and says, this may not be a problem after all, since the specimens could be just a small fragment of a larger meteorite body. Now at this point, we felt what we ought to do is to call this fellow up and say, look, these were removed from the human body during a surgical procedure, because I don't think the lady stepped on a meteorite, and I don't think the guy whacked one with the back of his hand. So he came back, and he shouldn't have done this because this guy is a metallurgist, not a biologist, and he came back with a second theory, which is uh, absolutely, totally ridiculous, talking about the use of ceramic in the body. And uh, you don't use ceramic in the body. At one time it was used in dental procedures. It's not used anymore. And why is it used anymore? Because it causes a tremendous inflammatory reaction. So uh, where we sit with this, outside of getting isotopic ratios, which are underway, we've got somebody that's walking around with meteorite samples. Now, John, if you want to run the video, <coughs> We'll wind up with this uh, gory stuff, and uh, the night with me will be done. So uh, here you're going to see it. It's underway. This is the first patient we did on August the 19th of uh, 1995. If you can catch the sound down, uh, John, it's really not worth it. Like we say things like that, and that's what You see this instrument going in here? Watch carefully. And there it is. Now that took an hour and a half to get to that point. The uh, cameraman, the videographer, was a, a registered nurse with the uh, Veterans Administration, member of MUFON, for a number of years. He got so excited when he took this out and was placed on the sponge, uh, the camera in this case was out of focus. And it takes him a few minutes before he uh, 
figures out that it's out of focus and gets it focused. But uh, it's very unusual, as you can see, we're playing with it, teasing it, uh, trying to get some of that uh, membrane off, and uh, nothing seems to move. It, it, you, you can't picture uh, the excitement that went on uh, all through the office, and we did have, uh, this was pumped out to a, uh, a television also at the first surgery where we had a number of witnesses who uh, watched this uh, as it was going on. This was recorded on uh, two different videos. Uh, still photography was done, and we had two professional writers uh, that were there to write it up. Now he's got